Let me read to you a passage from the sixth chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, verses 45 to 52. It's the Gospel for Wednesday after the Epiphany. St. Mark writes, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get to the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. That's from Mark chapter 6 verses 45 to 52. What does it suggest to us? Well, you know, one of the many notable characteristics of the modern secular era is its many-sided scepticism in respect to miracles. It is one aspect of the modern scientific interest in the laws of the material world. There is a good side to this, inasmuch as it is unlikely that, at least in the public and civil domain, spurious religious claims of miraculous events will be accepted. There is a sense in which scepticism is healthy. What the scepticism characteristic of modern secularism amounts to, though, is a deep reluctance to admit any claim to miracles. It can spring from a presumption that the visible world is all there is. Alternatively, those who admit a supernatural realm and to allow for a supreme being may still be resistant to anything miraculous because of an assumption that this great being only acts in and through the natural laws of his creation. Again, they tend to regard miracles as being, in any case, trivial in significance. Miracles are somewhat like tricks, and in a certain sense lack substance. They are not given weight, and the public attitude to the requirement of miracles by the Church to complete the process of canonization is an instance of this. What I am saying is that a culture that is strongly predisposed in this direction needs to be aware of its prejudice so as to take proper account of the action of God in, say, Scripture and in particular in the Gospels. Christ worked many miracles and the secular denomination of him as a miracle worker often has a dismissive character. By contrast, the period prior to the age of modern science and technology expected that God would act miraculously, which is to say, outside the normal laws of nature. Each age has its tendency, and each age must take account of its particular prejudices in considering the objective facts and their significance for life. We of the modern period will tend to disregard miracles as being, with some probability, spurious or trivial. In respect to Scripture, and in particular the Gospels, we will tend not to contemplate their significance enough. Now all that having been said, let us turn to our Gospel passage today, in Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 52. Let us place ourselves not in the position of modern secular man, sceptical as he tends to be, in respect to the reality and value of miracles, but let us place ourselves in the position of the apostles in the boat out in the midst of the storm. It has been a long and busy day with large crowds, Jesus teaching them at some length, and finally a striking miracle of Christ feeding them all with a handful of food. The apostles were doubtlessly weary, and at our Lord's direction, Immediately at the end of it, they had set out across the Sea of Tiberias. But it was not to be the end of the long day, for all night they had to row with the wind against them. The Greek reads, 
for they were in distress. But lo, Jesus, seeing them from the land, seeing them in their plight, took to the water himself. He strode steadily on its surface, amid the contrary wind and the heaving waves. Calmly he moved on, rising and falling with the surface, sprays of water beating against him, his garments and his hair responding to the gusts of wind that swirled about him. Strength and tranquility glowed in his features, and his stride was steady. Power and kindness rippled across his figure. Perhaps the moon lit up the vast and powerful lake, and the disciples saw coming towards them a living figure on its surface. It was a phantom, a spirit of the underworld, a menacing spectre coming to do them harm. The busy day had become a nightmare, and the master was not with them. They were alone before the terrible elements, and now a dark ogre of the sea was coming at them. They yelled in terror, and with that they heard the figure speak. Unbelievable! It was the Lord. Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. A deep astonishment descended upon them all. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. The Master had come to them in the midst of their difficulty and had resolved it. And notice the words our Lord had used. It is I. The Greek is ego emi. They were the words Yahweh had used when Moses asked for his name. I am who I am. Ego emi. Our Lord used them deliberately. Perhaps with that long past event in mind of which he as God had been the saving protagonist. It is I, Yahweh, who am with you, who am with you to save you. I shall be with you. Let us take seriously the miracles and all the deeds of Jesus Christ as recorded in the Gospels. As St. John chooses to regard them, they are signs of his glory. We saw his glory, St. John writes, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us contemplate the wondrous person of Jesus Christ, our brother, our saviour and our God. Let us make room for him in the boat that is our life, knowing that if we take our stand with him, all will be well. <laughs>